Welcome. My name is Cindy Arnson. I'm the director of the Latin American program at the Wilson Center. And uh, um, on behalf of um, the director of the Brazil Institute, Pablo Sotero, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, discussion today with Leonardo Abritzer, a former public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center, on his book on um, participation participatory institutions in democratic Brazil. Um, Paulo, despite his um, <clears throat> many talents and ability to multitask, has still found it uh, impossible to be in two places at once. He's currently um, in Rio. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Leonardo, who uh, was a public policy scholar here um, three years ago? Four years ago. Four years ago. Um, he is currently an associate professor of political science at the Federal University of um, Minas Gerais in Brazil um, and has been a major figure in uh, developing sociology about Latin America and in, about Brazil um, in particular. He has a PhD in sociology from the New School for Social Research um, in New York and has also conducted postdoctoral um, work at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, he's author of two other books on democratization in Brazil, one on democracy in the public space and um, Another book in, I'm not going to butcher the Portuguese, but it's basically the morality um, of democracy. Um, Leonardo's book, which is available for sale outside, and I hope you'll all get a copy so you can get it signed while Leo is here, um, expands the knowledge about participatory institutions beyond um, the studies of participatory budgeting. Um, in Porto Alegre, which has been, I think, the most prominent example of, of democratic governance at the local level um, um, instigated and, and uh, put in place under the PT. Um, this book looks at other examples in Sao Paulo, in Belo Horizonte, in Salvador, um, and, uh, and, and, and significantly under, um, expands our understanding of how this has worked. Um, in Brazil um, in creating um, democratic citizenship and in expanding participation. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to invite um, Leonardo to make an opening presentation of 20 to 30 minutes and then invite your questions and participation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, first of all, I would re really like to thank the Wilson Center, the Latin American Program, the Brazilian Institute and the Wilson Press for the support of this work. Most of the book has been written uh, when I was a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center. Um, I think that the book Participatory Institutions in Democratic Brazil, um, it's uh, an attempt to bridge participatory uh, st uh, studies on participatory institutions in two different phases. Uh, I myself have been working on participation the last 10 years, and I have written uh, one of the first books on participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre called Democracy and the Public Sphere in Latin America. But my view is that um, in the last 10 years, uh, most people really took what I would call the celebratory approach to participation, to participation in Brazil, to participation in Latin America, and right now to participation worldwide. Um, it's true that uh, uh, some of the examples of participation have been successful, and it's true that Brazil became a powerhouse for the studies of participation. But uh, I think, and one of the main aims of this book is to take issue with the view that once you introduce political participation or once you introduce social participation at the local level, you can solve most of the problems that exist at social level in the developing world. But more than that, I would like to take issue with the idea that whenever you want to introduce political participation or social participation at the local level, you should uh, implement participatory budgeting. So what I try to do in my books is really to establish a divide in between two different kinds of work. Uh, I really think that this laboratory moment is over. I think that participatory institutions are an important device for the implementation of pu public policies in the developing world, but I think that our uh, knowledge about how this institution works is still very limited and that it's not helpful to take an approach that once you introduce 
uh, participatory budgeting at the local level, you're going to solve all social problems. So what I did in the book was to try to broadly define what I call participatory institutions. And in my definition of participatory institutions is forms of grassroots participation initiated by the state that draw simultaneously on participation and on representation. And I think that uh, I would like to emphasize a few of the elements of this definition because many times I have been reading works that I think present experiences of participation in Brazil very differently from what's taking place. For instance, it's a, as if we're talking about direct democracy in Brazil, and I would say that the recent experiences of participation are not about direct democracy. They are about collaboration in between uh, representative institutions such as the state, uh, lawmaking bodies, and participatory institutions. Uh, but I would also like to, to pay attention to the fact that most of the experience of participation today ec that exists in Brazil today are initiated by the state, something that has been also very overlooked uh, by the literature. Um, what I do in the book, uh, broad, after broadly defining participatory institutions, is to show that there are many forms of social participation in Brazil, and they all should be taken in account. Uh, the literature in particular, uh, the international literature, has concentrated on participatory budgeting. There are today in Brazil 201 experiences of participatory budgeting. This is the last figure from 2008. But there are in Brazil 5,000 health councils, and there are in Brazil 1,600 and 60 experiences of city master plans. So if we, we look broadly in participation in Brazil, we can see that participatory budgeting is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. And in addition to that, I would say that there are many cities in Brazil in which participatory budgeting does not work well for many reasons that I'm going to briefly elaborate, but city master plans and health councils work well. So. What I did was to study the strict uh, forms of participation uh, in different cities, four different cities, uh, Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte, uh, Sao Paulo and Salvador. Uh, why is it that I chose these cities? Uh, well, I chose these cities for uh, two different reasons. One is everyone knows Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte. Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte became very well known as successful cases of participation. Uh, there are many European and other uh, international agencies programs in the two cities. So we can consider these cities, let's say, the powerhouse of political participation. Participatory budgeting ex uh, was introduced in Porto Alegre in 1990, it exists in Belo Horizonte since 1993. So the two cities can be regarded as being very uh, highly participatory cities. But I think that the right question is not whether all other cities can reproduce the experience of Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte, but, uh, but it's rather why most of the other cities cannot reproduce the experiences of Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte. And that's why I decided to study Sao Paulo and Salvador. Sao Paulo I decided to study for two reasons. One regarding the political system in the city and one regarding civil society in the city. Well, Sao Paulo is a city that um, has never been governed by the same party for two straight administrations. Um, uh, just after democratization, General Quadros was elected by a, a former president, by a, a small party. After him, the Workers' Party governed the city for four years. After the Workers' Party, two conservative administrations linked to Paulo Maluf. After the two conservative administrations, the Workers' Party again, and now the PSDB, the party linked to Cardozo. So. Uh, the political system in the city of Sao Paulo uh, shows to us, in a way, completely different 
from the one in Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte, in which cities in which we see long-term continuities. The political system in Sao Paulo seems to be uh, the key to the understanding of the city. And one of the consequences of this, shi of this shift in between left and right in Sao Paulo is that uh, even the Workers' Party uh, is not willing to bet uh, very much on political participation in the city of Sao Paulo. And it's not willing to bet because process of participation take longer to deliver, because the Workers' Party always needs to craft alliances to govern the city of Sao Paulo, and these alliances mean appointing at the regional level people from other parties, and this collides with the process of participation, and the Workers' Party cannot give a good answer to that. In addition to that, and differently from Porto Alegre and Belo Horizonte, civil society is very unevenly organized in the city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo had the story of strong civil society organizations uh, by the end of the democratic period. This strong civil society organization was sponsored by the Catholic Church, but after the division of the Archdiocese of Sao Paulo in four pieces in the 80s by Pope John Paul II, what happened is that political participation in Sao Paulo became insulated in the eastern parts of the city. The southern parts of the city of Sao Paulo are not well organized. There are not too many civil society organizations. On the contrary, what we see in the southern part of the city of Sao Paulo are new Pentecostal churches organizing forms of social participation that are not very political. And the problem uh, in introducing participation in the city of Sao Paulo is that you cannot count on civil society actors in all regions of the city. So how can you propose a citywide form of political participation? So when we look into the city of Sao Paulo, um, the question we should ask is, is Sao Paulo the rule or is Sao Paulo the, the exception? And I would say that many of the processes that take place in Sao Paulo take place also in other parts of Brazil. And the fourth case that I wanted to pursue uh, was uh, the city of Salvador uh, in bit until 2004. And the city of Salvador is a very interesting case of a city governed long run by a conservative administration. As a matter of fact, there is a local oligarchy that still exists in Salvador linked to Antonio Carlos Magalhães, former governor, minister, uh, 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 and governor of the state, mayor of the city. Um, and uh, his political group has always been against any form of social participation. So the idea of choosing a fourth case, and a case which is the most difficult one, is how can you do forms of social participation that are mandatory according to the law in a situation in which the political system is strongly against these forms of participation. And that's uh, why I pursued the case uh, of Salvador. And just to give two very brief examples, because I'm not going to talk much longer uh, about Salvador. One is how the civil society representation Salvador Health Councils uh, was appointed directly by the mayor of the city and who are civil society representatives, the archbishop of the city, the commercial association of the city, and uh, an ethnic association called Olodum that uh, uh, deals more, more with race issues. When we look into El Salvador Health Council, and we look into civil society actions within the Health Council, what we see, civil society does not express itself. And it could not possibly express itself given the, the appointees. And when we go to city master plans uh, in Salvador, what we see, uh, we see uh, a huge attempt by the city uh, to go around national rules for the organization of city master plans. So, um, just to try to wrap up some of the issues that I point, in, uh, I point out in my book, what, uh, what do I try to point out? That in cities where the political system is not united, 
behind the process of political participation and in which civil society is strongly divided or not homogeneous around the city, in general, participatory budgeting does not work. But there are other forms of participation in Brazil that work in these cases. So the case of health councils in Sao Paulo is very instructive. Why? Because in spite of sheer opposition by the mayor and by the political system, we have nice results in Sao Paulo, such as the increase of the access of the poor to medical appointments. Uh, and even in the case of Sao Paulo master plan, in spite of strong opposition within City Hall, we still have an important city master plan in Sao Paulo. So what Sao Paulo shows to us, that uh, in places where politics is contentious and civil society not well represented, other forms of participation based on mandatory participation, legal institutionalization of participation work better than participatory budgeting. And what Salvador shows us, Salvador shows us that even in cases where political society is openly against social participation, even in these cases, mandatory forms of participation that require public audiences can at least halt actions of conservative political actors. So uh, my point is that we can see different roles that can be played by political participation that the role of political participation is not just one, and it's not just mobilization from the grassroots level. It needs to be understood in a broader sense, and that different cases in Brazil show this. So just to conclude, and with very, three very brief points, one is participatory budgeting does not work everywhere, cannot be extended everywhere, and it's highly dependent upon context. Second, recent experiences in Brazil show that participation linked to councils, which are more sort of power-sharing forms of participation or public audiences, they work better in contexts in which participatory budgeting does not work so well. And the third point is different that there should be different forms of implementation <coughs> of participatory processes. Uh, so it's good that so many people want to pursue forms of participation today, but those who should, who want to pursue forms, forms of participation should have in mind that participation has to be adopt, adapted according to context. So I believe that uh, the, the role of the, of the book or what I expect with the book is to further qualify process of participation to show that is, it is exactly by being able to differentiate different forms of participation that we may perhaps be able to enhance social participation in Brazil and elsewhere. Thank you. Wonderful. Howard. Well, um, thank you very much. I was, I was just told that I should not wave my hand above this height or I'll interfere with the camera. Sure. Um, Howard Weard, a, a, pub, a uh, senior scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. <clears throat> and also, um, teacher of your colleague Luis Pedone and uh, David Fleischer. And um, one of my earliest job offers was actually at the Federal University of Minas Gerais way back, maybe even before you were born. But in any case, wonderful presentation, very interesting. I'm fascinated by this notion that um, your definition of participation includes state-created organizations. Because as soon as you talk about the state creation of uh, participatory organization, you're talking about corporatism, which has a longer tradition in the political theory of Brazil than does direct democracy or participation. So would you wrestle with this question, please, as to whether the institutions you're talking about are really participatory institutions or are they corporatist institutions um, or some combination of the two, which sounds very likely in the Brazilian context? Thank you. Before asking Leo to um, respond to that, is there another question or comment that is directly related to that point? Leonardo. 
And this is a very good point. And um, when I wrote the book, uh, uh, one of the reviewers made a very similar point. He made the point that, um, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the processes that I, I was talking were not linked really to participation, but were linked more to corporate forms of participation, which have a story, uh, a history in Brazil. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons that in chapter two, I really added a whole section trying to differentiate these new forms of participation in Brazil from uh, old forms of participation. Last year, I met Philip Schmitter in Italy for a brief uh, period, and we talked about my book. And again, he said, what, is this not corporatist? And he's, he wrote one of the classical books on corporatism in Brazil, yeah, uh, on the interest intermediation. And um, I think that I explained to him, and in the end, he told me, yes, I think you have a point. It's something different. But let's see what it is. So uh, my point is the state initiates forms of participation, but one, of, one uh, important aspect, they are not mandatory. Uh, second, the state is not the one who really uh, picks up who are the guys who are going to participate. So I would say, uh, given that, that two main characteristics of corporatism, uh, at least uh, as it has been known in Brazil during the 30s until the 50s, uh, uh, are not uh, present in forms of participation. So what I think is the state in Brazil is initiating what I would call neo-pluralist forms of political participation. So um, the state has a, a role, but the role is more in the uh, enhancing of political participation in a pluralist way than in the old corporatist form. And how we can see that, we don't see very much involvement of trade unions, we don't see very much involvement of economic interest, we see involvement of interests that are much more partial. And this is perhaps one of the good uh, ways to differentiate corporatism from pluralism. That corporatism, uh, in the end, you have two or three interests that sit in the table to negotiate, but when we're speaking about pluralism, we're speaking about multiple interests that are more, much more partial. And I think that this expresses better uh, what's taking place in terms of participation today in Brazil. Quick follow-up, uh, Does the state then grant juridical personality uh, to these groups and also, does the state provide funding to these participatory groups? Uh, and I guess thirdly, uh, do these groups then have monopolistic control over their area of, yeah. of, uh, of regulation and participation? Because that would also further your yeah. differentiation yeah. between the two types. Yeah. That's also a very good point. No, the state does not grant juridical uh, uh, status to the groups but it gives juridical status to the institutions. So if the state creates, for instance, a health council, the health council has a juridical status, but not those who participate, yeah? Uh, it, does, it cannot give money to the actors uh, who participate or monopolistic uh, status. As a matter of fact, there is competition between groups on who are going to be the participants of social actors in house councils, city master plans, and other kinds of councils in Brazil. Sure. Thank you. Very, very uh, nice, succinct uh, presentation. Uh, the question is, in the beginning, the participatory budgeting uh, was interpreted by many uh, scholars as a possibility in Brazil of not having only uh, representative democracy but also representative uh, participatory democracy. How does this movement influence or not the representative democracy if that is, uh, is, is, uh, is a trend in any of these places? Mm -hmm. uh, recently there was a meeting at Columbia University in which uh, uh, Rosa Serra was asked about participatory budgeting. 
and, uh, and he refuted it, saying that uh, in his conception, this is really not something that improves in any ways efficiency of the uh, governance. In fact, he said uh, anecdotally that it's almost like fishing in an aquarium, uh, referring that these are obvious uh, projects that will be chosen with a very small amount of budget uh, allocated to these. So what is your view on this? Sir, could you remind us of your name, please? Yeah, my name is Efim Schluger, and I am a consultant with the World Bank. Okay. Leo, if I could add to that yeah. question, I was wondering, you raised a, a, a critical point as to the difference between representative democracy um, and the kind of participatory democracy that you're describing. Um, representative democracy is traditionally thought of as through political parties, and now you're talking about um, these um, additional creations um, of uh, participatory bodies linked to the state. So I was wondering if, um, I don't know if you're, if, if this is a fair question, but if you could um, expand the definition that you gave for participatory democracy into also the, the, the different forms of so-called direct democracy um, that are counterposed to representative democracy, you know, so that you have a distinction, say, between um, the cases of Venezuela or uh, Ecuador and, and what's going on in, in Brazil. Could you see how you, how you yeah, yeah. see those differences? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, both questions are very good. Um, Brazil has a, a very unique constitution, yeah? So the Brazilian constitution on its Article 14 says that uh, the people is sovereign, it can be uh, represented uh, in different uh, institutions, but it can also take the uh, decisions directly, yeah? And it uh, mentions uh, different forms of taking these decisions, among them uh, plebiscite and uh, what we call in Brazil a popular initiative of law. Um, the amazing thing, however, in Brazil is that when we think about the definition of the Constitution and what took place in the country after 1988, we see that the forms of participation that the Constitution envisioned are not the ones that are practiced. Yeah? So Brazil had uh, uh, two plebiscites, yeah? three popular initiatives, legal uh, popular initiatives, but has about 10,000 councils, and perhaps there are more councillors than uh, local lawmakers in Brazil, about 100,000 uh, local councillors. So the issue is how come that this very unique blend of participation and representation emerged in Brazil? And I would say the Workers' Party explained part of the story, perhaps civil society associations explained uh, the other part, uh, but what I think it's key is in all forms of participation in Brazil, there is collaboration between representatives and those who participate. And I think that this is what makes Brazil unique in relation to other South American cases. Perhaps we have a few experience, similar experiences in Uruguay and perhaps a few similar experiences in Chile. But I'm absolutely convinced that what's taking place in Brazil is very different from what's taking place in Venezuela and in the Andean region as well. Um, why is it different? One, because the state really broadly relinquished decision-making when it organized this kind of participatory institutions, differently from, for instance, uh, Circulos Bolivarianos in Venezuela, for instance, in which uh, one of the, re the, the aims of Circulos Bolivarianos is to organize the communities, the second is to defend the Bolivarian Revolution. Yeah? If we read on the aims, uh, in Brazil, both the Workers' Party but also many other parties who engage in participation, they don't want to politicize participation too much. I think that uh, social participation in Brazil is aimed more on the generation of public policies than on the politicization of participation. On Serra, uh, two issues. Um, I don't think that these decisions are so obvious. Um, 
This is a, an interesting question. If you place, let's say, 1,000 choices for the population to pick uh, 50 or 60 every year, are these 50 or 60 decisions really obvious? Uh, I doubt very much about it. And I think that uh, in addition to that, once people choose, they become engaged with the follow-up. And the follow-up engagement is very important for democracy. So for instance, uh, budgets are more tight and more controlled in cities with participatory budgeting. There is most likely less corruption in cities uh, with participatory budgeting. Why? Because the population is organizing many uh, accounting bodies that, uh, that participate in the budgeting fo in the budget follow-up. Follow so even if we think that the government could technocratically make the same decisions, and I have strong doubts about it, I think still there are many other characteristics <coughs> that are important for democracy and accountability <coughs> that participatory budgeting brings into the political game. Here and then here. Yeah, uh, Chiao Chen, freelance correspondent. Uh, I, I'm sorry I'm late, but uh, I just uh, looked the uh, fry and the book uh, briefly. Uh, my question first is this Where the draft of the city budget and city master plan coming from? And uh, where, who provide the, sit, the money for the city operation? Uh, and uh, why this uh, four city uh, were chosen? And uh, where to go from here? Yeah. Um, well, um, Brazil, Brazil, Brazil used to be uh, a very uh, federal country, if we think in terms of fiscal uh, uh, policies. Um, up to 1964, perhaps well, Brazil was one of the most decentralized, fiscally decentralized countries in Latin America. The authoritarian regime uh, re-centralized many resources, political and economic, in its hands. But after 1985, or even before 1985, when Brazil's, Brazilian democratization took place, there were already uh, attempts of fiscal decentralization. There was a constitutional amendment in 1983 that already transferred uh, money uh, to the cities. Uh, so I would say uh, the money for participatory budgeting comes from the cities. But the tax collection capacity of Brazilian cities is very different. For instance, Brazil have, has more than 5,000 cities. Cities with really tax collection capacity, I would say that do not amount to more than three or 400 of these cities. Perhaps 10% of the Brazilian cities have tax collecting capacity. Uh, other and, but we see that participatory budgeting really takes place in the cities with tax collection capacity. And I think I did a study on that in the last three years. And one of the very interesting features is cities with, which have more participation in Brazil tend to increase their budget uh, through fiscal policies. So they become more dependent upon their own resources for fiscal policies. And cities which do not pursue participation, they tend to be more dependent on federal government transferences. So participatory budgeting somehow uh, makes city more fiscal responsible. Yeah? And I think this is uh, an important element. In addition to that, if we see other characteristics such as uh, balancing budget, efficiency at the administrative level, we also see that participation increases in the Brazilian case, these other features. I am an attorney and I specialize in international law. And I am curious to know how these participatory groups uh, represent and participate in, for instance, environmental issues that are international. 
uh, so how uh, how they organize themselves and how they go about participating like in Copenhagen and places like that. Thank you. Well, there is, um, there are experiences of participation in environmental issues in Brazil, but these are not the strongest, this is not the strongest area in which participation takes place, and it's also very regional. If you go to the north of Brazil, to the Amazon region, you're going to find more NGOs and more participatory arrangements linked to the environment. But in most Brazilian capitals, we don't see uh, the, the environmental groups as being uh, very strong. Um, there have been attempts of establishing uh, a state civil society participatory arrangement for the preservation of the Amazonian forest. And uh, this has been pursued by Marina Silva, who used to be environmental minister, and she'll run as an independent for uh, presidency now. But these attempts were vetoed by Dilma Rousseff, who is going to be the Workers' Party candidate for president. So there is a big debate on uh, how state and civil society arrangements, which kind of role state and civil society arrangements can place in the case of environment in Brazil. Uh, Lula's government introduced what is called Conferencias Nacionais, national conferences, which are very uh, large meetings that, takes place, that take place at the local, state, and the national level, and create an agenda, a thematic agenda for certain areas in Brazil. There has been an environmental conference uh, or there has been more than one. I think there, there have been two environmental conferences, and they have established an agenda for the government. But uh, Lula's government, uh, this is something else, uh, but it's linked to our topic, it's divided in between different, different ministries regarding environmental policies, because it's not just the environmental ministry that sets up policies for uh, for the environment, but also the Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah? And then you have big business, and I don't know if you know, but one of the places where big business in agriculture is making its headways in Brazil is the what we call the Baixa Amazonia, the lowlands of the Amazonian rainforest that have been deforested for, for uh, soy plantations and even for cattle plantations. Yeah, so there is a whole debate on that, and this is more uh, an issue that's being disputed, and it's behind um, the fact that Marina Silva left the Workers' Party and Lula's government. Joan Nelson, another senior scholar. Amanda, right here in front of you. Thanks for a very interesting presentation and a fascinating project. Um, a long time ago, I uh, did a certain amount of work in the 1970s uh, on uh, uh, neighborhood councils, uh, mainly in, in, in Brazil, but in a lot of other countries also outside of Latin America. Uh, and one of the kinds of issues, uh, there were several different issues that came up. Uh, one was the uh, uh, tendency toward partisan capture. Um, and I, uh, this was often uh, strongly resisted by some of those who'd organized the councils, but uh, it, it, uh, there was a strong push in that direction nonetheless. Another issue uh, that has also arisen in the U.S. experience back in the 1960s or 70s with an effort to form <coughs> citizen committees in the war on poverty uh, is the tension of interest between middle income groups and organizations and lower income groups. Um, I 
don't know whether these issues have arisen, what form they've taken, how they've been resolved, whether you see patterns. <clears throat> well, um, I think that the, the latter issue, middle income versus lower income groups, this is certainly uh, a big issue in most of the forms of participation in Brazil. How we can see it? Uh, we can see it in participatory budgeting, for instance. Many times middle class groups withdraw uh, from the meetings because they would say that the demand of the poor groups are so much uh, important or the needs of these groups are uh, much greater that they don't know exactly how, what they can uh, claim. And uh, participatory budgeting has answered uh, this issue, creating a specific thematic uh, uh, meetings where issues that the middle class is more interested can be discussed. For instance, a cultural meeting in which you can discuss cultural policies for the city, or uh, a uh, meeting on transport and circulation. Yeah, some of you who have been in Brazilian cities know that we are jammed in the traffic all the time. So, and this is an issue that really concerns uh, the Brazilian middle class. So, how you can improve transportation in Brazilian cities? This is also uh, one of the themes that has attracted uh, the Brazilian middle class. Partisan capture. I think is less likely. I have I have studied many cases, and um, first of all, what happens in, in this sense, Brazil differentiates from other uh, Latin American groups. Affiliation to political parties in Brazil is still very low. Yeah, it's around 10 percent, and uh, if you take the Workers Party out, it would go down to one or two percent. Even Pesci de Bé, who ran the country for eight years, has perhaps 10, a few, uh, 10 or in between 10 and 20,000 affiliates. It's, the number is very low, and they really don't invest uh, in party affiliation. So the issue would be more whether the Workers' Party capture uh, people who go to the assemblies, to the regional assemblies, to health councils, and um, I think that the answer, I would say most of the time it does not. But eventually what you can see is that, for instance, people who become very popular in participatory budgeting assemblies or in health councils may eventually make their headways, head, their headways into uh, city councilors' cabinets. I have seen this a few times, but it's not very common. But still, I know cases, both in, Por in Porto Alegre, I know a few cases. Yeah, in Por uh, eventually, participatory budgeting also generates new leadership, which is good. Yeah, but in general, this uh, most likely this new leadership would uh, uh, run or try to become council city councilors through the Workers' Party. So there is some link. Um, what there isn't, and this is perhaps what would be uh, the, the, the greatest danger of capture would be that these people would capture the participatory uh, process and then assign resources to their own streets or to their own neighborhoods. This I, I did not see. I have not seen this kind which would be uh, a step further in the process of capture. Amy. Well, Amy, excuse me, if you could just wait for the mic so we can get you on the video. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Kirschenbaum, and I work with the Inter American Foundation. As their Brazil representative, we strive to strengthen civic participation through uh, support for civil society actors, uh, non governmental. Uh, organizations in the region. I was curious uh, to hear uh, a little bit more about your outlook for the future. Uh, you referenced uh, with the question on the environment that that perhaps is uh, not one of the stronger sectors. 
uh, and maybe this is in the, in the last chapters of, of your book, and I just need to read it, but I uh, was curious as to if there's recommendations as a result of your analysis and research as to where you would focus uh, international cooperation or attention in order to strengthen already strong sectors or uh, try to bolster the ones that are weaker. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, regarding the environment, um, what the, the interesting thing that happened after Marina Silva left the government and the Workers' Party and became a presidential candidate is that the Workers' Party and Lula government really strengthened its environmental agenda after that because somehow uh, there is the possibility that the environment is going to become an issue uh, in the presidential campaign, and then the government strengthened. Marina got more of her own agenda after she left the government than when she was there. When she was there, she was a sort of isolated minister with a kind of agenda that was always contentious within the government. Lula was very much pissed off many times because of uh, environmental licenses that in Brazil take forever. His program, uh, PAC, uh, which is the program of, uh, of uh, uh, accelerating economic growth, many times it runs into problems with environmental licensing. The, uh, but the, his government wants to construct two huge new hydroelectric power plants in the lower part of the Amazon and it took forever to get the licenses for these uh, power plants. So all this created tensions in between Lula and Marina Silva. In the moment that she left government, um, a new environmental agenda emerged in Brazil. For instance, Brazil with China was uh, one of the countries which did not want to establish to approve targets for the Copenhagen meeting. And in the end, it brought uh, targets. And it brought targets because the issue became important in the Brazilian political scene. So uh, I would say that environmental issues are more related to this uh, broad scope of Brazilian policy making than to uh, more limited forms of political participation. Yeah? Um, recommendations. Um, I, uh, I think that. Uh, by reading my book, I think that uh, a few at least uh, uh, cautious steps uh, may follow from uh, the analysis that I made in the book. The first step is really understanding that participation takes place in a context. And many times I see international institutions not understanding this very well. Uh, so it seems that uh, the conditions that generated participatory budgeting are everywhere. And this is not true. So even to make regional meetings successful, you need uh, local associations or neighborhood associations that are not available everywhere. Even if you move across Brazil, you see that uh, uh, the strength of civil society varies from city to city, and in large cities like Sao Paulo, from region to region. Yeah. So I would say the first recommendation is look into to the context in which participation is going to be pursued. Second is uh, participatory budgeting tends to, to be very dependent upon the political will of the mayor or of governor. This is one of its uh, greatest weaknesses. Yeah? Um, we see many times that participatory budgeting is discontinued because of changes in government. Yeah? Um, this has been the case in Porto Alegre, though it is still exists, it exists in a much weaker form. This has been the case in Sao Paulo, in which um, uh, the city council approved the continuation <coughs> of participatory budgeting, but Serra vetoed the law because he really didn't want the continuation. So it was really dependent upon the political will uh, of the mayor. And uh, we see it in many other cases. So I also think that some form of legal institutionalization, that is the difference between participatory budgeting and the other forms of participation that I analyzed in my book, uh, is important. 
and legal institutionalization gives predictability and create rules that many times the government, after changes in government, new governments, may be still willing to engage. Um, I also think that forms of participation should be tried, that participation is very much exper exper experimental, yeah. uh, in the sense that it's not very clear what's going to work. Yeah? And it's good to experiment different formats, and it's good to see what works before, for instance, throwing all uh, your strengths in one form. I know, for instance, that the World Bank wants very much to introduce, to introduce participatory budgeting in Mozambique, but there is a local form of participation in the city of Maputo that works and is working better. So why, what is exactly the reason why you should create this kind of competition in between forms? We had a question, uh, where'd it go? Um, here was the next one and then back there. Yeah. Um, hi, my my name is Daniela Bujinova. I come from Bulgaria, and um, I uh, probably am biased because contexts matter, and I come from a very non-participatory context. So I very much distrust uh, forms of participation that are not mandatory. Um, I am a Fulbright scholar, and I research referendum popular initiative and recall in the United States, which is actually direct democracy, and wanted to make this distinction that direct democracy is not a synonym of per participatory demo democracy, because um, if, when you have participation, it's a discussion, expert advice, and so on, at the entry point of the political process. After all, the mayor may, as you said, uh, may decide not to take into consideration uh, the points of the public, of the participants in the discussion, because he is the one who all the counselors are the, the ones who make the decision. While uh, in direct democracy, in these three forms that are very well, uh, well <laughs> known in at least in 24 uh, states of the United States, uh, the public, the citizen or taxpayer, makes the final decision, and it has to be final and it has to be binding. So I think it is important to make this distinction. And because of this, uh, uh, of my field of interest, I would like to ask you, you mentioned that as many other constitutions do, but only on paper, of course, uh, your constitution also mentions the uh, that the people are the sovereign of power, so they have uh, the right to decide on some matters directly, not uh, via the representative government. And you said also that you have uh, popular initiative and the plebiscites. Why should probably um, the mechanisms are not w well working? What is your explanation? Why do people in Brazil uh, don't people in Brazil use these forms of participation and direct decision making or law making and prefer participation in the other softer forms of participation? Yeah. Well, um, we had two experiences of plebiscite after democratization. One in 1992, uh, uh, plebiscite on form of government, whether Brazil should be a parliamentary democracy or a presidential democracy. Um, and the other one on arms control, yeah, whether people should, uh, whether the, the government should prohibit bearing arms or whether it should not. The two, these two plebiscites, they show uh, a characteristic of the Brazilian, let's say, forms of direct democracy. That is, in the two cases, the reason why there was a plebiscite was because Congress could not make up its it mind on that. Yeah. yeah? So uh, the first case was, as, as a matter of fact, the Constituent Assembly. And uh, some people very much influenced at that point by Juan Lins, who had this idea in the 70s and 80s that the problem with the breakdown of democracy 
in Latin America was presidentialism. So many people uh, felt strongly that Brazil should change the form of government. Um, and, uh, but the Brazilians didn't see in the way Juan Lee saw the problem. Juan Lee saw the problem in terms of the dangers for the breakthrough of democracy. And Brazil uh, saw parliamentar parliamentarianism as disempowering the people as being able to <coughs> choose ultimately who will govern the country. So in the end, I think that it did not make any difference in the sense that Brazil could have uh, that dealt very well with the political crisis uh, uh, that took place after democratization, being a presidential country. Uh, the same has happened uh, with the arms control plebiscite. And the arms control plebiscite, uh, Congress was making a wonderful statute on disarmament. Uh, and uh, there are polls that show that one of the, uh, that, that violence in Brazil is high because of lack of adequate uh, guns control. Uh, but still, there were powerful lobbies in Congress. Congress could not make up its mind. At that point, there was a complete consensus among the major uh, parties that uh, arms control or gun control would uh, succeed. But in the end, it did not. The plebiscite was in the midst of the Mensalão campaign. Lula decided not to campaign for it. The PSDB thought that perhaps it should not identify itself with the government. In the end, only lobbies campaign against gun control, and they won. So the story about uh, this mechanism in Brazil is that they are not very effective in Brazilian democracy. No, none of the major, the major issues in Brazil were decided through plebiscites. Some people argue that perhaps plebiscites in Brazil should be more local and should really deal with more local issues. But this is not what the Brazilian Constitution say. But having plebiscites on national issues did not work at all in democratic Brazil. So there are no this, local referendum. Um, they are not prohibited, uh, but they have to be uh, called by the local legislative bodies. And these bodies did not want to, to call. This is another difference in between Brazil, Venezuela, and many other countries who, who took the more plebiscitary uh, way. Brazil certainly, the Brazilian democracy is not a plebiscitary democracy in the sense that Venezuela or, or Honduras or other uh, countries in Latin America are. So I would say it does not work because uh, uh, there is a view that the, the issues that should uh, be dealt by participation are other issues, not the general issues, but exactly the thematic issues linked to public policies. This is the view of the political elite. Well, it's the view of the political elite, but I, I would say that's also the view of uh, many Brazilians. I don't see a movement for more plebiscites in Brazil. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Back here. Uh, Elcio Santana with the uh, IDB. Uh, Leonardo, I, I just want to thank you for the excellent presentation and actually the excellent discussion also. So it's been quite, quite interesting. I, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a bit on how do you see participatory budget and other forms of participation at the state and national level? Well, when Lula was elected in 2002 and inaugurated in 2003, there was a debate in Brazil on whether participatory budgeting should be brought to the national level. And Lula and his ministers were strongly against. Lula, uh, he wanted to pursue forms of participation, but he did not want a national participatory budgeting. And my view is that he was right. Why? Because when you organized participatory budgeting at the local level, you don't deal with different forms of government, yeah? Uh, mostly you have a few conflicts with city councils, uh, but uh, city councils in, in Brazil are not very strong, yeah? They cannot uh, create new spending. They are really a very weak body at the local level. So there are not major institutional conflicts 
when you introduce participatory budgeting at the local level. There was one experience in Brazil of trying to introduce participatory budgeting at the state level, yeah, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, when the Workers' Party governed it in between 1998 and 2002. And the experience there was an experience of uh, important conflicts between the government and the state assembly, yeah? Because the, per the, the state assembly uh, felt that some of its important prerogatives were being abused by the executive when it called a statewide participatory budgeting. And Lula, I think, envisioned rightly that if he would introduce participatory budgeting at the national level, the same kind of conflicts, or even sharper or stronger conflicts, would emerge at national level. So um, what he did was really not to pursue this line, because in the end, uh, a national budget would have to be disputed with the National Congress, and this dispute was not what the Workers' Party government wanted. So what the Workers' Party did at national level, it introduced other forms of participation, especially what we call today in Brazil the National Conference. National conferences, about three million people participated in these national conferences. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I think more than 36 of these conferences took place in many areas. And uh, what they are, they are meetings that take place at the local, state, and national level, and they create a civil society agenda for the government. So they try to create an agenda, to prioritize this agenda, and then it's up to the ministries to pick up elements of this agenda. In the areas in which there is more participation in Brazil, health, urban planning, uh, social assistance, uh, even the environment, I would say that these agendas uh, boosted other agendas uh, uh, at the level of the ministries. In other areas, they were just very broad, uh, let's say, letters of intention from civil society to the government. But still, uh, they established important channels of communication between civil society and the state. So I would say that this is the model that uh, uh, is being pursued by Lula's government. Right now, I don't know if it's going to, to be implemented or not, but Lula asked two of his ministers to elaborate what he calls consolidação das leis sociais, the consolidation of social laws. So uh, everything that was done by his government in terms of uh, distribution of income, such as Bolsa Família, or process of participation. He want to integrate everything into a law and uh, to try to institutionalize these new forms. It seems, though it's also not clear, that José Serra will, in March, announce that, uh, as Lula announced a letter to the Brazilian people, saying that he was not going to change economic policies sharply, Serra wants to announce in a letter to Brazilian people that it's not going to change social policies sharply, which I think that are, are both things are good for the Brazilian democracy. Show that, in fact, as we see changes in government in Brazil, we don't see changes in government in which one government disassembles everything that the other government did, but exactly that there are main guidelines uh, that are starting to be institutionalized in Brazil. And in my view, this is what democracy is about. So it seems that in this consolidação das leis sociais, these new forms of participation will assume the format of new laws. I'd like to jump in for a minute and ask you um, perhaps to, to deepen a little bit um, what you've said about the relationship between participatory institutions and representation in Brazil. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the literature on democratization in Latin America is sort of replete with references to crises of representation, um, not only in the Andean countries, but uh, um, as a general phenomenon kind of underlying, you know, the general disencanto with, with democracy. So I w would like to have your sense. I mean, you made a reference to um, the very small 
um, numbers of people that have formal affiliations with political parties. And I was wondering if you could um, make a comment about the relationship between the expansion of participatory institutions and uh, uh, overall levels of representation in, in Brazil, sort of a classic political science question. Um, and then a related question, I was wondering if you could situate um, this analysis within um, the broader debate in Latin America over decentralization and the relationship or the impact of decentralization um, on, uh, on democracy and whether it's something that has, uh, you know, strengthened representation and strengthened um, democratization at the local level or whether, as in the case of Colombia, um, decentralization has undermined um, um, the authority of the state and diverted resources away from the national government and, um, and towards um, uh, the um, individual states and municipalities. Well, um, my view is that uh, there is a crisis of representation in Brazil as a whole, maybe in the world as a whole. I saw Obama's speech yesterday, and I think there is a crisis of representation in the U.S. as well. Um, but I think that the Latin American crisis of representation is perhaps a little bit different because you go to some regions, for instance, the Andean regions, you ask for support of, for political parties below 10 percent, yeah? And the main warning book on the crisis of representation in the Andes, uh, I've seen some of this data. Um, in Brazil, uh, there is also a crisis of representation, no doubt about it. Uh, many scandals in National Congress, and the scandals um, are linked to the fact that, that uh, uh, we still uh, could not pursue a good political reform, and because we don't have a good political reform, uh, there is l very low levels of trust on the political system. When we ask about trust in surveys in Brazil, um, the, the houses of Congress and the local le legislatives come very, very low. V very few people trust uh, these institutions. Um, I think that this explains in part why participation is so important in Brazil, because I think the representatives themselves, they think that, instead, that participation, instead of taking part of their power, strengthen them if they can engage in a good relation with the councils, with the other participatory budgeting, uh, with the other participatory institutions. So instead of participation decreasing the legitimation of the representative institutions, what I think is that they, they, they boost or they sh shore them up a little bit. And uh, this helps um, because many people in Brazil would, wouldn't trust Congress or local legislative bodies to decide on all issues. But they say once these decisions have been taken in other places, the, I think that population feels more comfortable with this kind um, of decisions. Um, the issue of, say, of decentralization in Brazil is very interesting because the Constitution was very uh, uh, federalist and decentralized, both power and fiscal resources. But it produced, it produced uh, uh, a fiscal crisis because the federal government was so big and it, uh, it could not cut its spendings in the same uh, speed that it lost resources. So 1989, 1990 were key years in Brazil with hyperinflation and many other uh, problems because of the way the Constitution uh, uh, decentralized uh, some of the policies. What Cardozo did, even before he was president, when he was the Minister of Economics, was to create a fund called, uh, I think, Drew, if I'm not uh, wrong. Um, uh, it's a fund that took part of the resources that have been previously decentralized to states and the cities and create a stabilization fund. This stabilization fund was very important to reduce deficit, the, the fiscal deficit to acceptable levels. But once inflation came down, 
then decentralization policies, I think, thrived much more. Because it's, it's also very, uh, when inflation is very high, it's very difficult uh, if the federal government in Brazil would postpone a transfer to a city by two months in 1990, this would mean 20, 30 percent less transfers. So uh, it was really when inflation went down that most of these decentralized policies took place. So I think that Brazil is decentralized in some areas and not decentralized in other areas. It's highly decentralized in health. So for instance, the unified health system is very decentralized. It's decentralized in social systems. Um, and even in these cases, there are many resources that are in the hand of the federal government. And what the federal government does, it transfers it to the cities. And participatory institutions are important. Because, why? Because there is what is called in Brazil, transferencias de fundo a fundo. There are, there are local funds that the federal government transfers health money or social assistance money to these uh, local funds. And what is required? It is required that when the city uh, accounts for the spending, the presence of the health council or the presence of the social assistance council he has to sign. And this created new levels of accountability with the transference of these resources. Other areas in Brazil, in my view, are still very much centralized. So public works, transportation works, uh, these areas that used to be the key areas of the developmental state are still very centralized areas. Yeah? And in my view, they don't work as well as the social policy areas. I think we have time for one last question. If there's anybody who hasn't asked a question, we'll take that first. Sure, this gentleman. Hi, uh, if you could wait for the okay. mic, yeah. Scott Schmidt, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, going back to the example on referendums, when you when you look at a lot of these in in Oregon and California, particularly, except for uh, this last week, um, a lot of them have been used to reduce taxes, um, whether it's property taxes or, or whatnot. Um, often drastically in, in that, you know, to, to and directly affecting education budgets and, and whatnot. But you're saying in uh, several cases in Brazil this has this, this type of, um, I guess, participatory democracy has led to tax increases. And so I was wondering <clears throat> if you've looked at that and what you might think might be um, uh, the explanation. Yeah. Um, well, the situation is different because uh, what happened in Brazil is that at the onset of democratization, the tax collecting capacity of cities was very low. Yeah. So uh, the constitution gave new prerogatives to the cities to create taxes, especially property taxes, and also progressive property taxes that did not exist in Brazil until 1988. Yeah. All, all property taxes had to be flat yeah, before 1988. And after 1988, progressive property taxes were introduced. So uh, cities had alternatives. Yeah? They could introduce property taxes. They could introduce property taxes uh, at different levels. Or they can introduce progressive property taxes. And that's uh, the interesting phenomenon is that the cities in which participation took place, Porto Alegre, Belo Horizonte, uh, Recife later, were cities that introduced progressive property taxes. And they started to rely much more on their own resources than on federal government uh, transferences. And um, uh, what we see today is that also the cities administer better their resources. How we see that? One of the things that we uh, uh, we measure in Brazil is number of pu public employees in the administrative machine in related to number of public employees in social policies. Every city in which there is more participatory policies, you also see more personnel in social policies. So it changes the ratio between the administrative and social policy personnel. So uh, I would say that these are characteristics uh, of the participatory process in Brazil. Uh, 
that are important in large cities. I only studied cities uh, with more than 100,000 people. Uh, so I'm not sure that this would happen in all other cities, even because I think that small cities in Brazil have very low tax uh, collection capacity. But in these cities, I think the reason is that there was a space, a legal space created by the Constitution to increase taxes and uh, participatory processes forced somehow governments to take these steps. Uh, Edno, <laughs> if you will have to, I think, follow up um, afterwards, please join me in thanking Leonardo for a wonderful presentation and, and uh, for all that we've learned about Brazil. Um, this morning, you're free to follow up. There are copies of his book. Um, thank you for being back here. Yes, thank you.